Welcome to Insight, today produced in collaboration with KCOS 13, El Paso Public Television. Today we are chatting with Brenda Risch, Executive Director, and Julian Casillas, Board President of the Borderland Rainbow Center. Brenda and Julian have generously agreed to share some of their experience with us. I'd like to thank you both for joining us today. Thank, thank you for having us. Thank you for the opportunity. So Rainbow, Rainbow, it's the entire community. It's, it, it, it is in El Paso. Talk about the Borderland Rainbow Center, its founding and your mission today. Well, it's, it's been an amazing journey for us. We've been in existence for about a year now, um, and this all came about. Um, I've, I've been in El Paso since about 2004, and I've been active in our community, the LGBTQ community. And um, I was training to become a master's level social worker. And in my first internship, I had the opportunity to co-facilitate a group for the parents and family members of, LG, of transgender youth. Um, there was a lot of need for helping support those folks and understanding what their young person was going through and how their family would be changing and what this meant for them. And uh, my co-facilitator, uh, Grace Perez, the president of PFLAG and I, were really dedicated to this and we did it for about a year. And the agency that was hosting us closed. And so I saw this coming. I saw, oh, they're going to close. We're not going to have a home for this for this group and for its companion youth transgender group. And this is a vibrant like activity. We need this. Every week we have new people asking for services. What are we going to do? Where are we going to go? A lot of our members wouldn't be comfortable necessarily in a church. There aren't a lot of free spaces to have meetings. So as uh, in that spring semester of that year, I performed, I designed and, and executed uh, a needs assessment of the LGBTQ community in El Paso. And I got about 562 respondents, which is a pretty good sample. And I found out that people indeed needed, we needed a community center and that those, they had very clear ideas about what we needed to have available for folks. And so the top five things that came out were space for support groups, um, drug and alcohol free social space, um, uh, access to medical care, uh, things like uh, educational and um, social workshops, you know, opportunities to develop oneself, learn about culture, things like that. And so um, I took the data from my needs assessment and I just went out into the community. I started talking to city council. I talked to business people and I had this one page brief and I would just go up to someone and say, hi, I know that you're a business person in El Paso. And I was wondering if you might have a building because I need a building for an LGBT community center. And believe it or not, that worked. Um, I was able to find someone who gave us a space. Um, we, rehab, we rehabilitated that space. It had been um, in disrepair and they were very generous with us. And we had a home from September 2nd when we opened last year through May of this year. And then some folks in the community uh, kind of approached us and said, hey, you know, we have a more centrally located spot and we'd like to help you get started here nearer to public transport so that we can you can really be accessible to folks. And we're like, absolutely. We love this. So we saw the space. The week before Mother's Day, we moved the Wednesday after, and the next day we're open having support groups again. So it's an it's been an incredible journey. Like all of the the families who were involved in these support groups, the different LGBT members of the community, they just came forward and donated time. And so all of our activities are volunteer staffed at this point, which is phenomenal considering that we're open seven days a week. How did you get involved, Julian? So I am El Paso born and raised. Um, I had the opportunity to, uh, life took me to the San Francisco Bay Area upon graduating from UTEP. Um, there it was in, if there's a Pride Center or an LGBT Center, it's like, which one are you talking about, right? right. Um, and so my life brought me back um, this past August, right when, you know, the Border and Rainbow Center was coming into fruition. Um, once I saw this come upon my Facebook feed, I immediately connected with Dr. Rich, who we've known each other from my undergrad years. Um, and yeah, my, I, I had a huge passion for youth. Um, seeing them as our future and to ensuring that they're not living in a society where they feel like they need, they, they're marginalized, bullied, what have you. And so I came forward, I presented the idea of bringing some leadership programming for our students and yeah, things just kicked off and I've been honored and privileged to be part of this opportunity and so much momentum and um, being in a leadership role now has provided me with a great perspective of how to best serve our community here in El Paso. What is the role of, of the center in, in helping people who have sometimes felt with justification that they are sitting outside. 
Oh, I mean, I think we're we're central to that role. Um, we are the only um, professionally run alcohol and drug free space where people can come and socialize. So not only not only the programming that we offer, the support groups, the education, the, the safe social opportunities, but the fact that it's a space where everyone is accepted. Right. Like anybody can walk in the door. I mean, we're open to the whole entire community. For example, we have a food pantry and anyone who's in need of food is available is 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 welcome to come and receive services. Um, we've partnered with lots of different kinds of groups, not just um, things that are focused on LGBT people. And so I think that an essential part of being accepted and recognized and seen is knowing that this is a safe space for me and anyone who's my ally can come here with me. Right. And can be and can participate with me and can be part of this. Right. So we just have very simple rules. No tolerance for discrimination, no tolerance for hatred, um, violence, ugliness, you know, no racism, no sexism, transphobia, homophobia. And you're welcome. And we've had absolutely no problems. Actually, our neighbors love us. Um, we interact with them on a regular basis. And so it's been a wonderful experience um, offering that space. You, you've mentioned uh, drug and alcohol free a mm -hmm. number of times. Mm -hmm. This is a very important aspect because the isolation that one sometimes suffers and the rejection that, some, uh, that uh, people suffer mm -hmm. can be dealt with through a self-medication yes. in which you end up self-medicating to the point of addiction and in, uh, to the point of dysfunction. Talk about that whole aspect of the center. Well, I mean, that's absolutely the number one reason why it is drug and alcohol free um, and why we offer Addictions Anonymous um, LGBT friendly support group for folks who are struggling with addiction. Um, I think that many subcultures, um, their social and kind of public lives end up in a marginalized space. There's maybe one or two places in the community where they can go and be safe and be themselves. And for decades in the United States, this has been bars and clubs for the LGBTQ folk. And um, basically, what are you offering people when that's the only safe space that's available? I mean, it's lovely. Everybody enjoys nightlife, right? Like that's a normal part of an adult experience. However, um, we have lots of other needs and interests and ways of relating to each other. So for me and for the center, I think it, it's been absolutely crucial to have that family friendly space, um, you know, and then, then to have professionals available. If someone does come forward and say, you know, I'm really I'm really worried. You know, I've realized, you know, now being here that the rest of my social life has not been very healthy. You know, we can help people be connected with services in a way that's respectful and where they feel safe and seen and recognized for who they are, for the great people they are. And Julian, how, how does how does the board work and, and what are your what does your board membership look like? Um, so the board um, is a compromise of different community members. We are diversity lies in um, having members who are born and raised in El Paso. We have representation from military. Um, we have uh, youth, um, trans folks. Um, yeah, I think it's, yeah. it's it, it provides a a a wonderful perspective. Um, we are looking to uh, ensuring that we are reflective of our binational community to ensure that, you know, we have that um, open and welcoming space for anyone who walks in the door. Right. And so, I mean, and it's true for any uh, uh, organization. Um, they want to ensure that their leadership is reflective of, of, of the community that they're serving. Could you continue to, to describe uh, those different programs and services that you provide out to the community? Sure. Um, in terms of support groups, we have the transgender youth group and the family, the, the, the support group for the family members of transgender youth. We also have an adult transgender support group. Um, and then we do uh, a lot of um, coalition building, like we work with other organizations. So, so partners. Yes, partners. Absolutely. Like we had a, a jointly sponsored uh, event with one of the student organizations, Texas Rising, where Wendy Davis came and she talked about, we had a panel that we participated in about what happens when lies get turned into laws. So we, we do address, you know, issues of like education around legislation. Like obviously we're not um, advocating for a particular law or 
our candidate, but we do want people to be educated, right? And to be engaged in their, in their government. Um, we do, uh, we've done a series called the Queer Crash Course, which is a little bit of LGBTQI history. Um, so looking at the contributions of transgender folks to the United States, um, looking at the history of, uh, the terms that we use, things like that. So, and that's going to be a continuing ongoing series. Um, Julian, do you want to talk about a few of the things that you host? Yeah, absolutely. One of the funnest things that I get to host is our karaoke nights. Um, and so we uh, attract usually, you know, a, a, as young as, you know, seven or eight to, to our older folks and just get to get on a Friday night and enjoy some some nice music and holy, hopefully some good singing. Um, <laughs> it, there, there's some good singing. Yeah, there really absolutely. are. Absolutely. <laughs> um, beyond that, uh, youth events um, that we host. And one thing that I, that I want to emphasize that maybe hasn't been brought up yet is our accessibility. And so most, if not all of our events are absolutely free. Um, we do have um, some low cost for some of our therapy services, but beyond that, we want it to be 100% accessible for anyone who walks in the door. So mm -hmm. all of our events are free. So again, we're 100% donor um, run and volunteer organized um, nonprofit, and we want to do our best to keep it that way. Yeah. Brenda. Julian, thank you so much for planting the flag, for forging for others, for creating a path for the community. And thank you so much for your insights. Thank you. Thank you.